So welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview Treasury professionals about their Treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to Treasurers about how they built their careers, where they are now, and where they see both themselves and the Treasury profession going to next. This week's show, delighted to be joined by Rando Bruns, the Group Treasurer at Merck KGAA Germany. I had to get that right because we were talking before the show, Rando and I, about making sure it's the right company and then we're there. So we've done it. So uh, founded in 1668. Uh, in Darmstadt in Germany. Merck is the world's oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company. A uh, vibrant science and tech company. They believe in science as a force for good. Uh, in terms of numbers of people, we've got 58,000 employees in over 66 countries, finding solutions to some of the today's toughest challenges. Uh, but as always, I'm going to get Rando to explain that a bit later in the show. What we are going to do is we're going to go through from his early career. We're going to talk a bit about how he went to the dark side in, in banking, but it's all right. He came back to the bright side, so came back to treasury. So we, we dragged him kicking and screaming. So enough from me, as always. Rando, take us back, if you would, uh, to the start of your career, finance and treasury. Over to you, sir. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks sure. for, for having me. Actually, I think my path was already started very, very early when kids, you know, they wanted to become a policeman or fireman, cowboy, whatever. I wanted to work in a bank. <laughs> no, no kidding. And when I was five, six years old, I wanted to work in a bank. I like numbers. I like counting. I like to go with my piggy bank to the bank and count the money myself and so on. So I always had that dream banking, something I wanted. And that's actually what I did. So I, I left school rather early and with 16, 17, I started an apprenticeship in banking. Very classical way, did this, and then I worked after the apprenticeship a few years in banking, did my compulsory service, things like that. And the trigger for me was I went back to, to night school and did my higher examination in banking. And that's a point where I learned hmm, learning can be fun, you know, if, if you really like what you're doing. And then I decided that's what I want to do. I want to go to university. I quit. Uh, at the bank, I went back one year back to school to get my so-called high school diploma in business, and then I then I then I went to university. So I was always working in banking at that time. Obviously, also when I was studying in 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 Germany, when I was studying in the UK, when I was went to the US later for my master, also working for an American bank. And after ten years of banking, after my masters, I decided, you know, oh maybe there's something else, and I wanted to see the other side. And that was, it was uh, 1997, then I, I joined, uh, when I was coming back to Germany, GM, so Opel in Germany, and I started in Treasury. And before you did that, just that 10 years in banking, and again, you and I talked about this a little bit before, but what did that give you as a, uh, you know, for your, in your Treasury back pocket? Did, was it that you knew what the track bankers were wanting the other side of the table? How was that? Yeah, I mean, you, you learn how a bank works, what's important. Uh, policies you can just get a feeling for you you deal with customers you deal with with the bank organization so i think it's a solid basis whatever i did it's a very solid basis i had and and a good understanding also how how banks react and what they do and and why they do what they do so so i think that that's that's very good also to have that understanding if you work for corporate and you said then you came into treasury was it just that you know, it was the first role and Treasury sounded interesting or what happened? Yeah, no, deliberately. I also had some offers from banks, for okay. example. I had offers at different companies and I decided to go to for a Treasury role uh, in the end. I also had another financing else, but this was most appealing to me. And I also wanted deliberately wanted to go to a U.S. company at that point in time. Coming from the U.S., uh, I was particularly interested in, in GM and also in the automotive industry. And why was that such a passion for you? Just because you'd seen it and you liked it? Or? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I would have liked to stay in the US, but due to my visa, I had to leave it for two years. I had a two-year home country rule in my visa. And uh, I thought the idea was working for GM, you know, this bring, brings you back to the US or somewhere else in the world, uh, which in the end didn't work out. And uh, I, I changed the company. And But uh, also the automotive industry was very interesting in the mid-90s or so, growing and a lot of perspective and so on. So I think it was a good starting point for me. And tell us about Opal, you know, because I know it as a, an old brand and things like that. What, what was it like when you got there, Treasury terms and things like that? Well, obviously in 1997, mid of the 90s, Treasury yes. was completely different to what it is yeah. today. Yeah. So, so this was about 
cash management. This was about some risk management. We were embedded in the European, we had a European Treasury Center here to deal with them about payments, uh, leasing, all kinds of aspects, different things. So, so I had a steep learning curve, obviously, from that perspective. Yeah, but uh, Treasury itself was very much improving, I would say, single processes within Treasury and see what technology and what comes there, uh, like cash poolings and things, what we did at that point in time. So it was a little bit narrower than today, I would say, in terms of, of products you work with and the relationships uh, we had to banks. Uh, so quite different. Was it? Quite, do you think it was that back in those days? And again, that's when I first started in treasury recruitment. And you know, some of the things and the questions I would ask treasury professionals then were, as you said, they've, they've sort of evolved because there was a lot of more manual process. Everyone talks now about automation. With, oh, yeah. yeah, but you know, back in those days, it was just like you know, I, I, my, I've got you know, my youngest is a ten-year-old son, and he saw this thing the other day, and he said, "What does that button fax mean?" I went. Uh, right, that was when we sent pieces of paper and it was electronic pieces of paper. And he was like, what? <laughs> it's just like, just his brain melted. Our system, at least in, in, in Opel, was was Excel yep. and paper. Yeah. So when, when when we had a deal with a bank, there was a slip of paper you had to fill out and, and you give it to accounting and they do something with it and so on and so on. This was the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Very different. So it, it started to evolve and uh, you did some years there. And then what happened? Talk us through. Well, as I said, my, I think my, my, my idea was to go somewhere somewhere in the world again. And uh, at least at that point in, at GM, this was not the reality for finance people. Uh, it was one way. There were Americans going to Europe or wherever, also in the finance area, but from, from a European perspective in this US company to really move around, at least in, in my field, treasury and so on, it's very difficult. So I had to realize that I advanced within the organization there, but at one point I was asking myself, is it, is it what I want? You know, where will I be in 10 years and, and what is it? And then, then I got offered uh, a job at a, at a small cap at a listed company in Germany in special machine building on a holding level where I was responsible for finance as well as investor relations. And this investor relations part was completely new to me. So I was responsible for financing structures and whatever we had in the group, but also the investor relations. And that, that appealed to me. And it was also uh, logistically close by. I didn't have to change, you know, I was living and so on. And so I give that a go. So, uh, and it was, was a good move. So I, I did this for two and a half years, had, had a very steep learning curve in terms of IR and understanding the company as a whole and what to do and what not to do. And, and dealing with the board and so on. So very interesting, also very challenging. Uh, we're not the best times for the company. So I had to also to sell a lot of bad news to the market. It's also an experience. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then I, I was asked to, to move from there to a subsidiary to become CFO. And the company there was in a particularly bad situation, I would say. So it was after September 11th, Special machine building, the company went dry, no new orders. We were not sure whether it would make it. Yeah. And they were looking for a CFO. Apparently, it was so bad, they couldn't find more experience from somewhere else, outside or so. At least they were asking me. And I slept the night, and then I said, I do it. Yeah. You know, going there, but I think that was, it was, yeah, this was by far the toughest assignment I had in my life so far. Yeah. So, so going there. Um, one of my first tasks was to fire 25% of the people. And I think that was my toughest day I had so far. I was relatively young. I was going to say, you, yeah, when, when, yeah, this was a young management position, I get rid of a quarter of the staff. It was mid 30s, somewhere around mid 30s. So, and, and I had to talk to all the people myself in person, tell them, you know, you're fired <laughs> in the end. So, it was a very tough day, and, uh, and it was a tough time. I mean, I had a, I had a, a financing bank behind me that could pull the plug any minute. We had restructuring consultants in there. I had to call vendors every week myself to negotiate how much are we able to pay that week on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, also the new task I had, I was accounting, controlling, procurement, HR, everything that comes along with it. Yeah. 
I had a very steep learning curve, let's put it this way. <laughs> Just tell me briefly, you you know, again, so there might be other people listening that have, you know, thrown into that situation where you're having to let people go. And obviously that was a, a tough thing to do. Mm-hmm. You know, what, any thoughts on that, that, you know, how, how to do it, you know, and there's, there's never an easy way, but how, how would you? Yeah. I think everybody has a, has a different style there. I think what, what, what helped me is I tried to be myself. So I tried to be fair. I tried to be transparent. It's this kind of trust building to people you have to work with, being a bank's consultant, employees, colleagues, whatever. I think that that's that's something everybody has to find his or her way. Mm. Say that's me, and that's how I do it, and that's why I do it. And you try to explain what's going on as much as you can. I think that's that's one thing. In a situation like this, I think it's also personality type you need to have some stress resilience. Otherwise, it will kill you. So, and, and luckily, I don't know where that comes from. I have that. So no matter what's going on, I can have a good night's sleep. Mm. If you're not able to do this, I would not advise, you know, jobs. taking on that type of, yeah. of jobs. As I said, it was also pretty stressful and uh, we made it in the end. Uh, so we had a turnaround, like the profitability and so on. Not an experience I need again, mm. but it was highly, highly valuable for me because it changed my perspective. You know, in terms of, let's say, drastic measures, whenever you are in a management position, hey, people don't think about drastic measures. Mm. Drastic measure is if you have to fire your, your highly acknowledged colleague, if you, if, if, if you don't pay your vendors, if, if you think about how can I pay my payroll and so on and so on. Then you think about drastic measures and what to do. So, but this helps in terms of perspective, and it helped me also in terms of banking. I, I when when I deal with banks, I read with banks. I know how they react and how they are. If things turn sour, <laughs> if it gets really windy out there, and and that's what I always have back in my mind when I when I'm negotiating, when I'm reading contracts and so on. I always look at it from that angle. I think, and that helped me a lot to understand. You know what. What, what's going on then and what are the mechanisms yeah. when, when things like that arise? So it helped me a lot during my career to have that. Then we, we're going to move from that because then you joined uh, Merck, uh, KGAA. We'll come into that and you can explain about the company and stuff. Before we do, I was just going to mention, so one of our previous podcasts was with Philip Sass, the Vice President of Treasury at Unilever. And he was, and we talked about the fact he'd been that business you know, for many, many years. And I said, you know, why join a big business? You know, lots of people move around and things like that. So, you know, when I ask you this question, and, you know, as always, I know, I certainly know the answer because Rando and I have known each other for many years, but what then led to you joining Merck? And, you know, you know, we've had these big mega companies and mega corporates, conglomerates. What, what you know, tempted you? And then you've been there for many years. So, I want to sort of frame it in that, if you would, if you would. So, yeah, yeah I think first of all, uh, the company I was working for in the end was rather small, very international, rather small. I was looking for this global international environment, and I was looking for more perspective. Obviously, it was too small for me, too narrow in terms of where where my future is, and and that's what attracted me basically uh, at Merck, and I also was going back to treasury because that, that's banking treasury part was where my heart is, so to speak. Very good experience to have done accounting yourself and controlling and procurement and so on. Helps me a lot to understand where people in the organization are coming from. Yeah. You know, this understanding, I think that's, that's a very high value. But my heart is somewhere else. So my heart is really this, this banking treasury thing. That's me. And, and there was this role and they were looking for a successor for someone who was going to retire. And they had an interesting story. I wanted to build something, um, and that was that attracted me a lot. Yeah. So, and I, I'm there now in my 17th year. So, um, so something must be good. <laughs> exactly. Well, tell us about the group. It said that the you know the as you said there were different companies out there and things like that. Tell us about Merck, the part you work for, or who you guys are, just so that for the clarification for the listeners today. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned already it's the oldest pharmaceutical chemical company in the world. We are 300, more than 350 years old. And um, it's so basically, Merck, we have we have three different types of businesses. Everybody knows us from our healthcare business, so 
pharma products, products you don't want to use, it's cancer, multiple sclerosis, things like this, or fertility, and so on. Uh, but we have a very big life science business. Uh, by, actually, now it's the biggest business we have. Life science, so, so obviously we're one of the, we're benefiting a little bit from COVID, but we have a strong growth trajectory there in terms of uh, we are supplier of the pharma industry, of products they need for producing drugs or developing drugs. Um, and uh, we, the, the, the last business, the electronics business, we are, for example, a world leader in liquid crystals. So every iPad, TV, whatever, very high likelihood that our liquid crystals are in there. We're very big in semiconductor chemicals, mm. markets that are growing. So it's a diverse business, uh, what Merck is coming from. And uh, what's maybe a little bit special about this is we're public and private at the same time, this KGAA, that's what it means in the end. Yeah. We're stock listed, we're in the DAX. And 30% of our stock is stock listed and 70% is not, still family owned. So it's in the 13th generation of the family. We have roughly 200, a little bit less than 200 family owners, so to speak. And obviously they have a, big influence on the company. Mm. So they made it for 13 generations and they want to make it for the next 13 generations, so to speak. So there's a, there's a lot of governance that comes along with it and guardrails for the company and how the company operates. And do you see that as, uh, you know, from your perspective within Treasury, you know, is that, you know, and you talk to other treasurers on a regular basis and we meet up at various conferences. Do you find that, that uh, when you're talking to them, you have a different ethos, you know, when you're talking, say, the, the the global treasurer of another pharma company, and whereas yourself, you say, well, yeah, but we make our decisions slightly differently, or yes. yeah, what 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 what's that, what's that like? It's, it's it's also about culture and about how we operate. So when you when you talk about uh, when you when you talk to the to the people who who run the family affairs, they will tell you, well, we have been elected in this position for two reasons. Profitable growth, because the family is growing biologically, bigger from generation to generation, and to hand our heritage over to the next generation. And the second is very important. So in terms of guardrails and risk-taking, what is it? And in terms of perspective, mm -hmm. long-term thinking. So that's the reason why we have three businesses and three businesses that are independent from each other. So it's a diversification within the company. But it's also long-term thinking. So when we when we make investments, when, when, when we, we go into some fields, the question is, I understand that, but how is it in 10 years? How is it maybe in 20 years? And should we invest now? So obviously we are stock listed and the quarter is important for us, but 10 years is at least equally important than the one quarter we're talking about. So we have, I think we have more long-term thinking than others for that reason. And at the same time, we cannot be taken over. Yeah. So it gives the whole thing a little bit, let's say, freedom to operate. Yeah. Those guardrails. So, it, and it's a different culture. Whether you work for the shareholder you don't know, or whether you work for people you meet, you shake hands, you talk to, you know personally, it's it's, it's a little bit different. So it's a it's 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 an interesting, it's a different culture in Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's a very interesting one because when I did the research before the show and things, um, I listened to another podcast called How to Take Over the World. And this guy, this uh, podcaster, very good. He, what he talks about, he does biographies on different, you know, families, you know, things and people like Napoleon and Caesar. But one of the ones, and actually there's a lot of cross with the Rothschilds, you know, and then people talk about this banking family, you know, things, but they goes, he goes right back to their history. And not dissimilarly, a lot of the fact that because it's a family business and there's that ethos around it, that the decisions are made for exactly as you point out there, for the 10 years and 20 years, not for the 20 week forecast. You know, no, it, it's very and, different. And also it's about the heritage and I would say the genes of a company. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, you, well, Merck survived the French Revolution. Yes. The French German War, two world wars. And what, what not? So, so why is that? It has always been about science. It started as a pharmacy, and 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 it's always about science. And that's where we are one of our common Z science and tech companies. That's the genes we can 
we love to develop new things. We love to be market leading. We love to be first on, but we do not compete by price. Yeah. It's not us. You know, this generics business is maybe in pharma. Is people other can do better than we are. Yeah. We, are, we, we always have this technology thing in there. Let's, let's drill down into the treasury piece for a moment. Like, so 17 years, you know, yeah. you know have the, have you, do you just lock the office and not let them take you out because you love it so much? What is, what is it? I mean, again, you know, joking aside, how come a role like that has kept you engaged, but also 17 years there? What's that been like? Well, obviously a lot of things changed. A lot of things happened. When I started in 2005, the whole treasury department was consisted of eight people. Uh, finance or treasury was very much decentralized throughout the group. Um, our treasury system was Excel and paper. <laughs> um, th that was it. I mean, that was it was very, very basic. I mean, today the main treasury function, I have a little more than, than the pure treasury, but the main treasury function, we have roughly 40 people globally in different locations. We're in Uruguay, we're in the Philippines, regional treasury centers, we're in Darmstadt. Uh, and, and Excel still, Excel and paper still work very well for you, obviously. Well, yeah. <laughs> highly automated. We are highly centralized. We are one of, one of the most centralized treasury when we compare ourselves with peers, what we have built over that. And, and why is that? I believe I had the luck. I earned it, whatever. I had the freedom to build that. So within Merck, I had, to, had the opportunity and, and the freedom to build this. Uh, was, there were investments within Treasury, and we were showing that we are adding value. And at the same time, I had the luck to work in a company that were growing tremendously. So, so we, we, when I started, uh, we had, I think, something like $7 billion in sales. Nowadays, we are, we are roughly at 20 in, this, in, this, uh, in the 16, 17 years. And, and now we have the beginning of 2022, and we say by 2025, we will be at 25. So we're growing. And uh, at the same time, obviously, not only organically, but also inorganically. So we had lots of acquisitions, integration, things to do. And, and you have to build that and, and those structures. And, and I had the freedom. So I had, I had good managers, a good CFO I could work with all the time. And there were those investments made because we could show that we add value. So the value thing. And with that value proposition from you as a treasurer, when you're saying we need this new system, you know, we I know a joke there about sort of resilience of systems and some of the stuff, and you you talk very much that you embrace those things. And I know you've spoken about that at various, you know, conferences and, and everything else. What what's your what's your value proposition? What I mean by that is you go in and is like look, we need this because you know, these are the top three reasons, you know, again, so there'll be listeners today and they're thinking the same thing, but they, they're way behind you in technology terms and things like that. How, how do you sell it? You know, what, what, what's, your, what's your pitch? Well, I think the general thinking we have is you can, you can make your business case and in the end you have a number and yeah. you say, hey, this is what it costs and this is a financial gain in terms of euros. We went a little bit different about this. We were always thinking, and I'm always thinking when it comes to the core treasury processes and processes. And if you have a good process, then you will have benefits and you can try maybe to evaluate those benefits. In the beginning, we didn't even because we said the benefit will be so huge, we don't want to make up some whatever number. <laughs> we don't know, but it will be big. So this process thinking, that's very much embedded in whatever we do. And this process thinking is not about what's the treasury process. We, we started very early to think in end-to-end -end processes. What does it mean to accounting? What does it mean to shared service? What does it mean to the business? What does it mean to IT and so on? To really think about the company as a whole and the process as a whole. And if you can show that benefit, and then later, maybe at some point you have to translate it also if you want to make some investment in terms of euros. But whatever we do, we have this process thinking in mind. And not so much... Is it a financial gain? And why, and you have to make that case. And why? where does that come from? Is that just embedded in the group that actually by doing this, you know, there are a couple of companies, with, you know, just do good or just do this, you know, but, you know, they, you know, some companies maybe pay lip service to it. Is it that just the ethos? If you come in and you measure that when you look at someone that you know, maybe we talked about hiring people, is that a key thing you find? 
I think it's 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 maybe not so much going that's uh, also very treasury specific because we started this journey very early. As I said, when when we when we started that journey, and that's still something we are suffering of in our core processes is we have a completely heterogeneous ERP landscape. I wouldn't say completely, you know, we're migrating, doing whatever, but we have something like 30 to 40 different ERP systems within the group. So if you want to introduce um, a lean process in this group, ERP will kill you. And I see many corporates, you know, where they try to do something because typically you end up with where I do the largest 50 entities, I have the 80-20 rule, whatever. We, our processes are typically all 100% processes. Every entity in the group uses this process, no matter what ERP system they have. So we decided very early, in 2005, 2006, actually, when I started, very early to go system-wise for a system or for systems that are externally hosted, that are web-based, and that are relatively easy to connect to ERP systems, whatever it is. Or even you can you can enter manually, whatever it is. This ERP independence. And that allowed us to get a very high degree of, of centralization and, and, and global processes very early, whereas other functions were really struggling with it. We didn't right from the beginning when we started building this. So we're far ahead than others in this. And this allowed us also with experience to create a lot of unique processes where we are with, with only a few people, we manage the foreign exchange risk for the entire group. We have a, we have intercompany payment process. Every entity of the group is using this. We have a, a large extent already external payments within there, but also this risk management approach, very, very centralized, high benefit to the entire organization because in many countries, there's no treasury. Nobody does anything. It's, everything is automated and we centralize this was. And this is a beauty. And once you have established this, then it starts rolling. You can see, hey, that's really cool what they're doing. That this is something, this is something we should support and what they're doing. And then then becomes a kind of self-fulfilling and you get to all rolling and you ask for something and you have proven it's, it's, it's a huge benefit to the organization. And then you have more buy-in. And what's your ethos, your treasury ethos? And what I mean by that, so someone we talked before, and we'll move into this as well, about bringing someone on board. And as you said, um, Rando and I spoke before about, you know, if you're bringing someone into your team and they've just been within their local company and not really looked internationally and things like that, you know, they've not got that worldly view sort of thing. So that's obviously something that you think is key. Is that just, does that, permeate throughout treasury itself or you know where does that come from i think in my in, in our role because we have such a global function very important for us so that, that's that's an entry for me if i look for people by the way it's very difficult to get people or at least it takes me a long time uh never does you right just come to us that's it you know like <laughs> he, he needs to call me a bit more but you know we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that later in the show or after this. yeah so it takes quite some time but what i'm looking for is is really somebody well first I think what you need is you need a good foundation. Let's say you went to a good university, or whatever. So I think, but but that's that's done. A lot of people have that. Mm. So, but what 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 makes you different is this experience, work experience, practical treasury experience, being after your studies, uh, for example, have some experience or during your studies, internships. Have seen different things. You've seen the banking world. You've seen the corporate world. You've maybe been that. Uh, consultants have done different things, and certainly also the cultural thing. You study abroad, work abroad for a certain period of time, have this cultural understanding, and all this then comes together with good communication skills. But in, in general, what I'm looking for in people is this highly motivated, intrinsic motivated people that want to contribute and want to, want to change things, want to contribute, uh, want to work on, on projects, lead them, and, and, and they can identify very much with what they're doing. So this, the self-driven people, because that's also part of my management style. Mm. So, so that's, that's I, would, I would call it a long leash, whatever it is. So, so it's, it's, it's their idea, it's their project, it's their recognition, and I try to support as much as I can. 
But those kind of people I'm looking for. So you get those people on board. And I was just making some notes here that if you're experienced, you know, perhaps getting someone who's more experienced, you know, to come in and join the team and, and things like that, rotating through, what are you looking for from those guys? You know, we've got the entry level, but what, what, what is it? Again, is it that they've been at the other international groups and they've embraced that? Or is it, you know, because we've got this technology bias, what are you looking for in those? Well, I think it really depends on the role. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, my, in my function, for example, I have also my ITs within Treasury, so that supports of my entire IT landscape. Obviously, there you look for people, and we have changed a little bit. We were coming from people uh, coming out of Treasury and have uh, IT affinity and uh, work on that. Uh, I think now we're leaning more towards people coming from IT and maybe have an affinity to also work with Treasury topics. Uh, so those people are difficult to find. And typically, those people... They like to do IT. Mm. I think it's not realistic to have this person later on do corporate funding, financing, whatever. That's 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 different. When you look at at really at uh, at core treasury people, there are people who say, "Hey, I like to do treasury and I'm good at it, and I only want to do treasury." So that's the one, let's say, part of people that are out there, which can be very good if you have a very specific position. Mm. What I typically try to do. I try to develop my people within my team. So I try to, to give those positions to different people from, from inside my team. And the question there is, how, how do I get those people then? And how do I develop them? And we started very early. We started in 2007. We started our own treasury trainee program. So we're looking for graduates. Going through this program, one year treasury, one year outside of treasury, see different functions, have worked abroad and so on. And typically, those fill those positions, and they can advance within Treasury. And at some points, uh, Treasury is then too small. They will advance somewhere else in the organization, being in finance or the business. I have many examples of this. And that's where I get the people from. So my, actually, my main hiring pool, one of the main hiring pool is, is from these trainee programs, because the people I need, I don't typically don't get in the market. Mm. And I want people that are broad, that are looking at different aspects, and have a good understanding that's in the trainee program. Deliberately, they spend six months in business controlling and they spend some time in accounting and they go to a subsidiary somewhere in the world and things like this. So they're very round in terms of not understanding treasury, but also finance. Yeah, and, the and, business. And, and that's my thinking. So I like to develop people. And my, my thinking is, how can I develop them for the organization, not only for treasury, but for the, for the overall finance organization? So we've talked about your team and everything else and the challenges of you know, they're coming towards Treasury. Obviously, we've been through a few challenging years now. We were talking about remote working, work from home and all that stuff. And I didn't want to deep dive in that because that's been done so many times. However, looking at the future for you guys out there, within your Treasury team and yourself as a Treasurer, what are the things that are on your horizon? You know, what are you thinking about that's coming over the horizon? Sometimes I talk to people that saying their CFO uses their Treasurer, if you like, as a a little bit of a forward scout, if you like, saying, look, Rando, can you go look at this? Can you assess this for me and things like that? Where do you see the key challenges coming up for Treasury as we move forward? It's clearly technology. Mm-hmm. That, that's number one, digitalization. That's that's what I see in terms of, I mean, we work, for example, uh, already for quite some time now with big data, with AI, uh, but uh, you have to be more, become more, uh, let's say digital native, whatever you would call it, but uh, these are the technologies and they will, they will change processes, treasury processes a lot and also markets a lot. Um, and you have to be familiar with it. And, and in my role, for example, I wouldn't say I'm struggling with it or so, but you know, I'm, I spent quite some time to see what's going on there. And I will never be the expert in IT. So I'm, I'm useless at a computer or so. I will never be the absolute expert with that one. But for me, it's important. Am I able to ask the right questions? Ah, yeah. And am I able to understand uh, the answer. what's the benefit and what's the risk? Mm. And things like this. And, uh, and and this will become more and more important. So this, this technology part and IT part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're not quite at the end of the show, but we're not far off. As always with my guests, we will put your LinkedIn details in the show notes. So, it's useful to have someone in your network you can connect to rando and things like that and vice versa 
But we wrap up every show each week with some of the top tips. You know, so that might be, again, if you're a listener today, you might be in the early stage of your career. So, you know, I think you've already got some great stuff there anyway, which so definitely listen to that. But also, you know, middle stages uh, of your career or even other treasurers, you know, so what sort of, you know, advice would you give to those listeners today who are thinking, you know, crumbs, I'd like a, you know, a career the same as yourself. You know, what, what, what would you say? Well, besides the thing I mentioned, like, like, like good basis and so on, it's, it's truly the international experience, you know, working in a, in a global international environment um, that is uh, very important. And also having seen something outside of treasury. Yeah. Having, having, having had different roles and they maybe come back at some point in time. This is, this is very, very important nowadays to really look at end-to-end processes to understand the company as a whole. Uh, I think that that's why you bring in value to the table and that's why you appreciate it uh, uh, on board level to have that view and not just the single treasury view. Mm. And that would be my, my main advice, uh, what, whatever you do. And for other treasurers out there, you know, that's good for the guys coming into it and learning and things like that. You, you know, you, you again, we're getting back to that real world view now and starting to see people in real life and things like that. You know, what, what sort of, you know, not war stories, but what are the things you think, you know, you're, you're sitting there with a coffee and saying, they're saying, oh, I think this is what we need to focus on. What are you thinking is, you know, the, the key thing for the IT and digitalization? The key thing to focus on uh, is the core processes. If you if you don't have if you haven't set that up, you cannot you can talk about funding and risk management or whatever. But the core processes is the basis, and then I'm back to technology. That's mm-hmm. where everything that's that's really the foundation. And if you're stuck there, you will spend a lot of time on fixing things we we at Merck we don't have for the last ten years. You know, it's really about. Let's say, what's my FA exposure? How do I measure this? What's liquidity plan? We don't have all those issues because we have we have invented really smart processes to avoid a lot of those faucets. If you don't do this, you get stuck in, in those simple things. So if you use the processes, the problems go away. They solve themselves. At least you spend far less time on those. Yeah, we focus on other. on other things. Yeah. The value add problems and things. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, sir. Uh, great advice there. You know, so get your international experience. Don't be afraid to go for wider roles and just treasure. Go out to treasure. They'll have you back at any time you want. So that's good. Yeah. And focus on the processes. Uh, great advice. We'll put Rando's details in the show notes. You can connect to him if need be or not or whatever. Um, sir, amazing to chat to you. And as I said earlier, can't wait to see you in the well, when we can travel around a bit more, it'd be great to see you. Sure. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.